Let us pray. My Lord, our hearts are here this day to be subjected, O Father, to the guidance of your will. Grant us, O Father, the ability to hear and to see in a way that is spiritually shaping us and transforming us unto your will. Let it be today that as we would go through the Word of God, that the Word of God would go through us. And that there would be much fruit that is produced by our submission to your Spirit. Let it be, Father, that those in whom have been invited this day by a friend who maybe was just doing their friend a favor and coming with them today, let them know today, Father, that you call us. As you call us, O Lord, and as you draw us in through your Spirit, we know that you save, you forgive, you redeem, and you are with us. Father, we thank you, we love you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. It is good to be back here at Pella. Uh, my name is Will Sullivan. I'm the lead pastor at Endurance Church of the Valley in Tempe. Uh, anytime as a guest preacher, if you get another invite, that means you did something right. And so I am uh, really blessed uh, with the opportunity that Pastor Sean has given me, and it's always a pleasure of mine to be able to refresh other pastors as well to just have a moment in time to where they can pull back, have that type of space to be refreshed and restored. And so this morning, I have the pleasure of preaching about this one particular subject that is revealing whom it is that our Lord and Savior truly is as he gets close, closer to the cross and to the tomb. The title of my message today is The Audacity of Authority. The Audacity of Authority. Um, I just celebrated uh, two weeks ago 20 years of faithful marriage. Woohoo! Yeah. And with that, we have two children, the fruits of our labor. Gabriella, uh, my 12-year-old. We call her Gabby, and her name fits her character. And I have my son, Lucas, a boy's boy. Loves to explore, is curious, and more importantly, loves the Lord. So each and every week, we have a time in which we study the Word of God together. And if you've ever studied the Word of God with a child, it's interesting. Because they're going to bring forth some questions that you weren't thinking about. And they're going to have some off-the-cuff comments that have you scratching your head. Well... As we were going through, a couple of years ago, the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, this most holy week, we got to the place in which Jesus was overturning the tables in the temple. So my daughter, she stopped me immediately. She was like, Dad, I have a problem with that. I said, what's the problem, sweet pea? She was like, the nerve of Jesus. I was like, excuse me? She said, that's, that's not the nice Jesus that I know. See, the Jesus that I know, he would go to the temple, he would be nice. 
money changers and lenders. I'm here to knock over your tables. If you could scoot back for a moment, there's going to be animals everywhere, money everywhere. And as I'm listening to her to continue to describe this moment, it hit me. When she said, what nerve does Jesus have in doing this? Essentially, the audacity of Jesus. It was the audacity to be bold enough to disregard what was common and what had become normal. But what Jesus was seeing in the cleansing out of the temple was a normalcy of not trusting God, the normalcy of outward righteousness with a heart that is so far from Him to the extent that they could not recognize the Son, the Messiah. How dare he? I can still hear my daughter taking issue with her image of Jesus. If we're being honest, some of us may laugh in regards to that illustration, but some of us are walking here today with nice Jesus on your mind. The type of Jesus that would overlook your sin, the type of Jesus that, you know, wouldn't judge, The type of Jesus that will essentially give us everything that we want if we pray just a simple prayer. My daughter, she took issue with the image of the authentic and genuine Jesus. She felt, as some often do, that it was a violation of his love. Isn't it amazing, parents? That in one respect, you are this loving parent. You are helping your kids to grow, raising them right. You're getting them birthday presents and Christmas presents. And then the moment that you say no, the moment that you don't give them what they want, they feel that it is a violation of your love. They have a hard time understanding the varied characteristics of what a parent has to do if they love you. See, what my daughter had an issue with in regards to the image is that she didn't understand the office of prophet, priest, and king. She just saw Nice Jesus. What she didn't understand was that true authority is preceded by the position or the office in which you hold. So as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, as he is riding on this donkey, can you imagine what the religious leaders were thinking? Because they talk about it later on. How dare he receive the worship that is meant for God? But they miss something. The authority of Jesus, it didn't begin on a donkey. The authority of Jesus didn't begin in the end. The authority of Jesus didn't have a beginning, and nor does it have an end. Jesus is fully God, fully man. His authority doesn't come from man. Jesus is God in the flesh. See, he possessed the same intrinsic authority as God the Father, co-equal. But yet we read in Matthew 28, as the Son, there is also an authority that has been given as well. 
Jesus has authority and true and ultimate power over all things in heaven and on earth. His authority has no jurisdiction. And so we find here in this passage this advancement of the kingdom of God and as he gets closer to the cross and as he gets closer to the tomb, the revelation of his deity becomes more projected and clear. Because as the kingdom advances, what we should see according to the word of God is we should see the authority to forgive sins. We should see the authority to heal the lame. We should see the authority to provide salvation. We should, we should see authority to cast out demons. And the one that we struggle with to judge all humanity as well. It was the evidence of the kingdom of God. And you know what? It was upsetting the norm. It was upsetting what was going on. See, Jesus has the authority to rule. Let's go back to this verse. In verse 18, the Bible says, In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it, and found nothing on it, but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. Now let's pause for a moment. The question we should be asking right now, Jesus, what did that tree do to you? Did you walk by it? Did it scrape you, scratch you? What, what, what was it? That he has the audacity to curse this fig tree. He's declaring in a very clear object lesson He's declaring his authority to judge. They've been three and a half years, the disciples, with Jesus. This is the first recorded moment of Jesus demonstrating his destructive power. Well, hold on. What does that mean, church? That means three and a half years, all they've seen him do is restore and redeem and restore and redeem and restore. And, oh, judge. Curse. That doesn't sound like the sweet old Jesus that I know. But do you understand what's really going on at a deeper level? At a deeper level... The creator is speaking to creation and creation must obey. Do you see how terrifying that is in the moment? It's both marvelous and terrifying that the God in whom created the universe is right there in that moment speaking to creation and judging it not randomly. But as a lesson to the disciples that this tree didn't serve its purpose to produce fruit. How would you feel if today you had to Unfortunately, go to the hospital. And you show up, and you are screaming, Help me! Help me! 
And they look at you and say, that's not what we do. That's a head scratcher, isn't it? Because the outward appearance says, hospital, you help. But what you find is individuals who do not understand the intention by which they have been created. So we find in this object lesson that the religious leaders of Israel have an appearance of godliness, no power. That there's been a rejection of the Son, and to reject the Son is to reject the Father. Because people's minds are so preoccupied with wanting a political Messiah that they missed the Savior of the world. Nothing but leaves. It was false advertisement. Because those leaves, what that meant is that there should have been fruit on those leaves. And if you're reading this in context, what it means is that this tree was full of leaves. And in being full of leaves, Jesus is hungry. And as he comes up, he finds out it's a misrepresentation. And he takes this moment to tie it together with the cleansing of the temple that's coming up next. And that the temple was there to be what? A house of prayer for all the nations. And what it had turned into was a den of robbers. And he came in flipping and overturning because he is the purifier. He is the cleanser. And so he uses this fig tree as a lesson to display that there is this rampant sin of hypocrisy. I'm saying one thing, but I'm doing another. Watch where we go with this. If we're not careful, church, we will be purely confessional Christians and not covenantal. We will give lip service, but we will not give our hearts. We will be active in ministry, but our hearts will be far from God. See, those disciples, it would have... It would have stirred something from the Old Testament in Hosea 9 and Jeremiah 8 where Israel is the representation of the fig tree. And if the fig tree were to have fruit, that meant prosperity. That means that they were tethered to the trust and the belief of who God is. And so they act in accordance to who God is. But as we read in Hosea 9 and Jeremiah 8, what we find is that as the father comes to gather, he finds only leaves, activity and works. Essentially, let me say it this way, church, is that ministry was a business. Ministry was a business. I've heard it said that the worst thing about ministry is when you learn how to do ministry. Because once you learn how to do something, it becomes repetitious and routine. And then our worship becomes casual. So all of a sudden now, when you became part of this church and you started to greet, you did it because of the affections of the Lord and you wanted to affect change by being a loving, smiling face at the door. You did it for a couple of weeks and you've learned how to smile in front of people. You've learned small talk without actually getting to know someone. You've learned how to do ministry. It could be the same for a preacher. Me and Pastor Sean, we met in seminary. And you know what can happen? In seminary, you can learn the exegetical process of opening up and extrapolating the Word of God. But then you have to ask yourself, why do I need the Holy Spirit if I've got commentaries? 
Why do I need the Holy Spirit if I have an understanding of how to break down the scripture and get the historical context and understand the word of God redemptively? Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. Why do I need the Holy Spirit? Because if I've got it academically, if I've got it intellectually, then why do I need it? And then you find yourself with leaves, no fruit. Or... In the local church, we can get on social media and we can become more of a marketing type of church in the local body without true evangelism. And then we begin to think that because the church is full, that it's fruitful. When sometimes it's just a little bit of fruit and a whole bunch of leaves because people are coming in hurting People are coming in, I I, I need Christ, I want this, and then they get entertained. Jesus Christ is searching for true worshipers. Those who are worshipers in spirit and truth. He's looking for fruit from his people. Fruit. That fruit signifies, it indicates that you trust God. Because when we trust God and we're in relationship with Him, we can't do nothing but produce fruit. Because the Holy Spirit dwells with us, within us, producing that which is in accordance to His will. But nowadays, some of us, we want spirit, no truth. You want an experience on Sunday. And so there are churches that will sell experiences. Come in. You're, oh, you have, you, you have those moments. Oh, God. Yes, I felt it today during the worship. Yes, you're with me. And then Monday morning, you back fornicating. Monday morning, you're right back doing what you were doing before. Because you wanted a feeling, an emotional high, but you didn't want the substance of the truth that could actually change you. Or we end up being worshipers of truth. Some some of us have worshipped the Bible and not the God of the Bible. And it leads to legalism. Of being really hardcore and hard pressed on issues that aren't even a first priority. So this is what's happening with this fig tree. But (laughs) the disciples... You always gotta love the disciples. You gotta love Peter and the disciples. It's they just say the darndest things. You know, they have that show like kids say the darndest things, like the disciples and Peter, they say the darndest things. And you know, you know what they ask? Like, how did this tree wither? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I'm there, I'm not asking how, I'm asking why. Hey, Jesus, are you okay? Are you all right? But that how, they didn't get rebuked. But Jesus says this in response of how did the fig tree wither at once. Verse 21, he says, And Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Interesting question. How? My belief is this, and I picked it up as I was reading Mark 11, because Peter's response to Jesus was this Rabbi. May not mean much, but If someone has earned their doctorates, they earn the right to be called what? Doctor. They earned that right. We're in the Holy Week. And you've got disciples that are still calling him rabbi. Meaning that there is still some more revelation to go. Because think about it. You're asking how a tree withered. You saw me walk on water. 
you saw me heal individuals that were coming through the roof. I forgave them their sin. They, they got up and walked. You see me expel demons, and you're asking how? But what he does is so masterful. He doesn't rebuke them. What he does is he corrects the connection. It's a question of the audacity of power. That's what the question is indicating. Now, obviously, for some of you, you you're probably a little smarter than me, you, maybe you can dig out a couple of things in which you believe that this is speaking about other things than what it's talking about here. But let me tell you this. That in this revelation, in what he is sharing with the disciples and what he has done, it is a foreshadowing of Jesus separating the sheep from the goats. Well, Will, why would you say that? Because he says something here at the very beginning that I think we overlook. He says, truly I say to you, if you have faith. Oh, hold on now. I have faith. Look, I know where some of our 2023 brains just went. We have been weakened in our faith of Jesus because we believe our faith is our dreams. Our faith is our goals. Our faith are our objectives. And this ain't Oprah theology here. This ain't speak it into existence theology. Word to the wise here. You do not possess in your words the ability to create life. You don't. We have the ability to influence Influence, yes. But I don't have the ability to create life, so I can't just start speaking things into existence because if that's the case, if we could just speak things into existence, then the homeless man on the corner who every day wants food, who wants shelter, it's on his mind 24-7. What are you going to tell him to do, dream more? Have more faith? But a lot of us, what we've done is that we've taken faith and it's just about dreaming big. How many of you guys have heard those statements before where it's like, you know, it's not big enough until God is laughing at your dreams. You know, silly things like that, it's, which is why it causes individuals to go into a place of depression because they felt that they didn't have more faith. Instead of just having faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Look, I think we may be overlooking something here. We look at this and we're just like, this sounds like all I got to do basically is say in Jesus' name, and I get it. I get it. But I'm going to give you a, a different translation. It's called the Will Sullivan translation. It's kind of like the Amplified. If I am incorrect in my theology, elders... Tighten me up afterwards. But I want us to reread this with ancient eyes. Truly I say to you, if you have faith in me and do not doubt me, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in a prayer to me, you will receive from me if you have faith in me. 
Mountains don't move because of the articulation of your prayer. The impossibilities of our faith And the things in which we cannot move because to pray is to pronounce our dependency and our powerlessness. So when we come before God, it's because He abides in us. We abide in Him. And the Bible says in John 14 that if His Word remains in you, do what? Ask whatever you wish. That means that when we are coming and we are approaching God, it is not, God, this is what I want. This is what I want you to do. No, it's submissive. God, what do you want? Because here's the reality. Come on now, United States of America, we got it. Everything you want, everything you need, we got it. Some of the answer to prayer is actually to take away things from our life that are distorting the revelation of Christ and the necessity of His grace. Because we believe we can do it on our own. Jesus has not only the audacity to rule, but to reign. To reign. Verse 23 through 27. You guys still with me? Okay. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I will also ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come from? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it amongst themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are not afraid of the crowd. Or we are afraid of the crowd. For they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Obviously, if we're familiar with the Pharisees and the chief priests and those who are part of the Sanhedrin, they are always seeking to do what with Jesus? Entrap him. That's what they're always seeking to do. But they said something interesting. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you authority To do these things. So the next question we have to ask is what things? He's been teaching with authority. He's been healing with authority. And he has also been receiving the worship in which was meant for God. And he's cleansed the temple. Let me say it another way. They're like, who do you think you are? We didn't give you permission. That's what they're saying. Who do you think you are? We didn't give you permission. Oh, but there's something else going on. If you allow me, just in these last couple of minutes, they're attempting to humiliate Jesus. Well, watch where this goes. I'm not a military man, but I am somebody that scrolls YouTube from time to time. And there are certain shorts and reels that'll pop up. And there was a term that was introduced to my vocabulary, stolen valor. Stolen valor. When someone is impersonating someone in the military, they've got stripes, everything, and usually those individuals are trying to get the freebies in life. Do we understand that's what the Pharisees are attempting to do with Jesus? Humiliate him. Stolen valor. Stolen valor. Who's giving you authority? Who's giving you power? We didn't give it to you. They're attempting to humiliate him and essentially say that he's an imposter. Jesus don't need our authority. 
Jesus doesn't need our permission. Jesus does unto the counsel of his own will. So as they're attempting to humiliate him, I love it, he turns the tables, doesn't he? Well, you tell me about the baptism of John. Did it come from heaven? Or did it come from man? And I want you to hold this for a moment. They were operating under a fear of man. And in operating under this fear of man, they knew what was true, they knew what was right, but if they were to say that it was true, that it came from heaven, then John the Baptist, as the forerunner for Jesus, must be received and submitted to. And it shows you their true intentions. They desire not to submit. They desire to humiliate, to keep their popularity, to keep their profit and their power. That's what they were doing. It's what we call culpable ignorance. I know what is true, but I'm going to omit some things for my own comfort. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has given us authority as the salt and the light. Amen? And with this authorized authority by the Spirit of God, the world does not dictate what the church is to do. The world does not dictate. The world does not have authority. It does not have ministerial authority. It does not have declarative authority. The world has no spiritual authority. Be careful as we are in this world that we are not submitting ourselves to the world simply to comply with political correctness or the popular opinion of the world. The scriptures are our final authority. Amen? The scriptures are our final authority. Jesus has the audacity to rule and reign because like a lot of these athletes say, because Jesus is him. Jesus is him. So when you are him, you're going to move different. You're going to do things in which you know are the right things to do. It didn't begin on a donkey or an end. Why? Because Jesus is him. God in the flesh, who is with us now, desiring for us all to trust in him and to produce much fruit for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. My Lord, as we have uh, this moment, let us appreciate your coming and your leading by pausing to take some time to reflect and to respond. We are far from you, my Lord, as you call us today. Help us that we would submit to your calling, trust in you, live for you.